Hello, everyone, and welcome to theCUBE. We are going to talk about cyber resilience today. My name is Christophe Bertrand. I'm here for a CUBE conversation uh, with a great specialist in incident response uh, who is going to tell us a little bit more about what Cohesity can do to help you uh, when the time comes, but more importantly, before the time comes. So, uh, James uh, Blake, welcome uh, to theCUBE for this conversation. Why don't you tell us who you are, what you do, and your background, which uh, is fascinating. Yeah, my name is James Blake. So, my role is I'm the head of cyber resiliency strategy at Cohesity. So, I spend a lot of my time not talking so much about technology, but about the people and process, the operational objectives that we try and get using technology. And then I use that to inform our product strategy, um, our, how we deliver messaging around our product, and ultimately make sure I keep the business honest, uh, focusing on the problems customers have rather than just the features of the product. And my background is prior to joining, uh, prior to joining Cohesity, I came from a background of running an incident response practice for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We built over 91 security operation centers. I ran global cyber risk for JP Morgan Chase, and I'm the ex CISO of Mimecast. So uh, I've spent about 30 years of my life in cybersecurity and a lot of it um, dealing with incidents. Well, James, I have to say, I mean, risk is really your business in many ways. Um, and that's interesting here because obviously some of our viewers come from the security space and others come from maybe the storage or the backup and recovery space. And uh, when it comes to cyber resilience, it's really a team effort. And I very much like the, the experience you bring to the table and in helping us understand how to make this work uh, because it is truly a team effort bringing together uh, IT ops, cloud ops, security ops, and, and a bunch of other folks in the process. So let's talk a little bit about how Cohesity approaches uh, this, uh, uh, this, this concept of cyber resilience. And one of the things that's very helpful is to, to look at some existing models. Um, actually, maybe we can bring up a, a quick slide here uh, that you, you were very uh, kind to share with us. Uh, it shows uh, a few of the existing models. There's the NIST model, Sands and, of course, your own approach, which we'll talk about in a lot more detail. Tell us, how does uh, Cohesity, in general terms, approach these models? And why did you end up building your own uh, that you called a clean room? Uh, which, and we'll explain what that means in the context of IT and security. Yeah, I think, um, you know, having been on the other side of the table and, and uh, being subjected to, to vendor uh, positioning for years, I, I was quite keen as an organization that we don't do that. We kind of don't create our own uh, framework or workflow. What we did is to align two industry ones. And as you said earlier, um, incident response and cyber resiliency is a team effort, right? Business continuity and disaster recovery, just bringing back the last snapshot brings back the vulnerabilities. It brings back, uh, it brings back the persistence mechanisms and all the gaps or evasions in your controls. So you don't do that in a cyber incident. You have to investigate and you have to mitigate. And we already have well-structured processes for this, the NIST one and also the SANS six-step incident response lifecycle. So when we start to look at what utility and how would you structure cohesity to be used in that context where we actually discover what the adversary is doing, we stop the bleeding through containment, and then we actually mitigate the threats. It just made sense to align with those frameworks that most organizations are already familiar with, at least their security teams. And then take those IT teams on the journey of actually understanding how they have to transition from the strategies they may have around dealing with flood, fire, uh, earthquake, power loss, or equipment failure, and then actually doing the right thing for cyber incidents. Thank you so much uh, for, for these details. And actually, you know, brings up, um, I think, a, another question, which is, okay, we have these frameworks. Uh, clearly, uh, cybercrime is not stopping. Ransomware is, is rampant. Uh, organizations have many challenges. What would you say, before we go into the clean room uh, component, which I really want to double click on, what would you say the top challenges are that every day you see your customers or prospects are facing? 
Well, I think the first one I already alluded to and is the fact that organisations are treating cyber incidents like a traditional BC and DR incident. So what's happening is they're seeing the unavailability of systems that provide products and services as a, a b- business continuity issue and handing it wholesale to IT. And then sometimes IT aren't even involving security in that process. What they're doing is they're just the, the traditional process of taking my last snapshot, putting that back into production. And what we see in those instances are customers that have to recover multiple times because you know ransomware as a service they've got multiple affiliates that are targeting the same vulnerability. So if you bring a system back without patching it and understanding its vulnerabilities, it just gets retacked again. Or they've left persistence mechanisms in there or evasions of controls. These things just get recovered in the backup. And we see customers, they recover and they get hit again within two minutes. Uh, and they're doing this multiple times. They promise the business an RTO of, let's say, a day four days, yet it ends up being 15 times four days because they've got uh, failed recoveries and just reinfections again and again. Usually customers stop at that point in time and let's start investigating the incident. What we're trying to do is get ahead of that and make sure we've got the right environments for customers and the right workflows and processes to do that to really shorten that cycle and make sure they don't suffer from those problems. So that's the first problem. The second problem is organizations don't consider the dial tone services. They're not in the business impact analysis. And what I mean by that is I've dealt with incidents where people have not been able to make telephone calls, not been able to get physically out of offices uh, because voice over IP is down, because physical act physical access control is down. You know, these incidents can impact these services that we need to even respond and communicate with law enforcement, insurers, uh, you know, our stakeholders, the press. We need those systems back up. And then finally, the last problem is a lot of our security products are moved to the edge. You know, we're heavily reliant on endpoint detection and response. What's the first thing we do in all those frameworks we saw in the last slide? you know, containment. So all of a sudden you've created an island. These endpoint security tools can never be used for um, response and the hunting of those activities or even remote forensic imaging. That's another problem that we've got. Not to mention the fact if we look at the MITRE attack framework, the way we describe adversaries uh, and their behavior, the tactic with the most amount of techniques under it is defense evasion. If we're 100% reliant on just tools that sit on the endpoint, we can sometimes be evaded. And those evasions are being built into these ransomware as a service platforms. So they're the three biggest issues I see in organizations. Yeah, and, the, and these are fundamental because I think it really explains why you have to look at it from a very different standpoint. Um, I've been tracking and been uh, you know, part of many uh, product lines that focused on disaster recovery. And it's true that in many ways, disasters are sort of predictable or you kind of know what you're dealing with. And here you lack all sorts of predictability. Uh, And more importantly, you don't really know what hit you uh, and the extent, the scope uh, uh, to which you've been affected. And maybe even you don't even know for how long those uh, people have been observing you. So uh, I think it's time to talk more about uh, your approach with a clean room, which, of course, it's not a clean room in, in the medical sense of, uh, or industrial sense. Uh, that would be an environment uh, devoid of any infection, uh, which is kind of the idea virtually here from an IT standpoint. And really, the, uh, the idea is to look at this from, again, uh, a very uh, methodical perspective. So uh, let's uh, actually bring up uh, the, the workflow here. Uh, let's start with the first two components, uh, you know, around prepare and initiation. So, obviously, it's two two components that sort of have the same name, but they're not the same at all, and they are fundamental for the rest to work, which we'll cover in a minute. Uh, so, James, can you tell us more about these two steps and why are they so important? And by the way, what is that digital jump bag? I'm curious about that. Well, I mean. The reason why this exists is to solve one of those problems that I described earlier. And that is the fact that organizations typically do not consider the assets and resources that they need 
to be able to respond and recover from the incident. So, you know, if we look at every BIA that most organizations do, they focus on the most critical business applications that deliver products and services to customers. What they don't consider is what do I need to have in place in order to do investigation and the mitigation of threats in those platforms so that I can bring them back securely. And often what we find when I used to rock into to customers to do incident response is the first two to three days of an incident might be trying to find those switches, those workflows, those asset databases, contact lists, or lists, all of these things that we need to be able to communicate and collaborate and run the incident are often missing. And the time to get that is not in the middle of an incident. If you can prepare these resources and put them inside what we call the digital jump bag, which is effectively an immutable vaulted storage area, which has authentication mechanisms which are outside your traditional uh, business ones, which could be impacted by the incident themselves. So I love using a, a top P authentication mechanism on my phone. So even if you scorched earth and your entire organization has been flattened, you can get this jump bag up and it can be instantiated and mounted on your internal system. And within minutes or hours, you can rebuild that trusted environment, which is the initiate stage. Get my tooling back to a state inside a confined area where I know it can be trusted. We build those email servers, a Active Directory server, or some other form of identity management server that you're using to then authenticate those response capabilities and obviously get physical access. So it's important to understand that this initiate stage is doing nothing about recovering business services which are producing products and services. It's all about just that minimal, what we call the minimum viable response capability, just knowing you can trust your tooling and getting that up into a state where you can communicate with all of the parties that you need to join the incident and handle the incident. So absolutely, isolation, zero trust, no trust, and the ability to get back uh, on your feet with an infrastructure uh, that you trust, that you believe will allow you to get, you know, get business processes back in, in place, which is interesting because in reality, you're, you're, you're right. So we used to think it's just the data that can get corrupted or deleted. Well, it's getting leaked. That's another issue. But it's also the infrastructure. If you can't access or log in to your business applications because your network or your identification tool have been uh, affected, then there's no business. So I think it's uh, very important to be comprehensive. And I think just what, you, what you've just explained here demonstrates why it is that you really need to have this uh, collaboration between security teams and infrastructure teams across the board. It's uh, truly a team sport. So uh, let's talk about the uh, last couple of stages, uh, which is really where uh, the, the solution uh, sort of kicks in. Uh, so I'm going to uh, bring that up real quick here. Uh, and what you're going to see is that, of course, once you're back on track, um, you are going to start looking into what happened and then uh, hopefully recover. Uh, so tell us uh, briefly about those two stages and then uh, again, uh, tell us about the migration piece, because you have to sort of get back into a production state. You can't just run from uh, an isolated environment uh, in production uh, for a long period of time. Yeah, and um, so the important thing to, to remember is that initiate stage, it's only about getting the response capability, security tooling, the identities needed for response and recovery, not the identities of the whole company. So what you might find is uh, what we used to call when, when I was delivering operational resiliency uh, for a large bank, what we call resiliency category one um, apps. They are the most critical apps that we needed to run the business. But underneath that is almost resiliency category zero, which are the things that security and IT need to do to manage the incident. So we've dealt with those at initiate. But now what we're starting to do is work on that critical business applications. So this is when we actually use the native capability of a data management platform like Cohesity to aid overcoming some of those problems around 
the containment introduces. So when I talked about the fact that now your endpoint security solutions are isolated because we disconnected the networks or the hosts to prevent uh, spread of the infection, well, we can still conduct forensics on the file systems which are within the data management solution. In fact, we can now time travel across the time of the incident because it's not like traditional forensics where we only see a file system at the end. We can actually now see a file system across the entire timeline of the incident, which really empowers analysts. And I think it's an untapped resource that a lot of people in the security operations center don't know exists. But then you've got things like threat hunting. If you can hunt for IOCs and you're relying on endpoint security controls, well, we know they can be evaded. And there's 43 techniques in defense evasion in MITRE ATT&CK, more than in any other stage. And people are baking things like EDR killer into their ransomware as a service platforms. But guess what? If you're using that offline data that exists within a data management solution, you can't be evaded using those traditional techniques. And we still work off the containment. So actually, those problems that are introduced uh, but, you know, I mentioned in the last section are actually solved by using a data management solution to do that. But it's a team sport. You mentioned that not just between IT and security, but between security vendors as well. And that's one of the reasons Cohesity built the Data Security Alliance with leading vendors like Splunk and Cisco and Palo Alto and Zscaler, uh, just to name a few, is because we work with those solutions. So when you go into containment, some of those solutions no longer have access to live systems, but we can provide that context of the data to them, even in containment. So we work on providing these native capabilities to speed investigation, and also through our integrations with third parties to make sure that you truly understand how they got in, how they maintain persistence, how they've evaded controls so that you can actually then move to the next stage, which is mitigate. So you typically the investigation environment is owned by security. And now what we do is we go into a mitigation stage. And there are two strategies to mitigation, and that could be rebuild systems. And this is where you can hold the golden masters of those systems and trusted configurations in the digital jump bag. So we are literally rebuilding a system or you can recover a system and then clean it. So you do a volume level backup, you're able to recover that system and then clean with that information you learned from the investigation stage, those uh, artifacts off there. So we support both approaches and, and you might actually choose to support both. And then on a case by case basis after the incident go, this system has only got three artifacts on it. Um, I'm just gonna clean it. Or you go, I've got 17 tasks to make this system ready for production again. Um, what I'm actually going to do with this one is rebuild it because the level of effort is lower. So all about squeezing that response timeline down. So, uh, and then finally, you need to test, right? Those mitigations, patching things, uh, you know, uh, all those mitigations might introduce functional performance problems. So typically we recommend customers can use a dev environment as their, their um, mitigation environment. And then what they do is snapshot that entire environment and then lift that back into production. So we actually replicate the production environment in the mitigate stage. And we do that by holding the hypervisor or network configurations in the jump bag so that we're able to, for each set of workloads that we're bringing in, configure that environment, snapshot it. So if you didn't catch everything, you don't have to go back to square one. You can just restore that snapshot, do further investigation, mitigation. And it's a pipeline. You know, once you got to mitigation with one set of workloads, you've already got your next level coming in through the investigation stage. And this is really the process we do in incident response. It's just normally as incident responders, we charge customers an awful lot of money to do it. Well, so uh, really the takeaway here for me is that, uh, and for our viewers, I hope, is this is a very different world. Uh, I think it's going to fundamentally change how you architect your teams. Uh, it's going to foster better collaboration across uh, 
multiple teams and you also mentioned the ecosystem of vendors. Uh, I think that's actually very critical. The people piece of it, which we want to have time to discuss, is probably uh, as critical uh, as the process and the technology. So uh, we've covered a lot of ground here, James. I'd like to thank you so much for your time. I think, uh, you know, there's a great solution here. I mean, it definitely has a ton of different components uh, that uh, set it apart. Uh, I believe that it is much needed in a market that is seeing a ton of attacks. It's not going to go away. Uh, and it's great to see how uh, Cohesity is bringing to the table people like you and, and, and really trying to uh, bridge the gap between, well, what used to be uh, different worlds, siloed maybe a little too much, and this new world, which is not necessarily great, but at least one in which we have options to be able to recover and be more resilient. And remember that every time you invest in making your infrastructure, your, your environment more resilient, it's an opportunity to uh, improve the business as well. It's, it goes straight to the bottom line and probably the top line too, because you can still transact. So James, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, and to our viewers, thank you for your time.